This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Public health has been top of mind for many of us for the last couple of years now, but there's a growing public health problem that has largely flown under the radar growing rate of sexually transmitted diseases and infections. The number of STD and STI cases among Americans have been rising steadily each year since 2014. Even the pandemic, which trapped millions of us inside our homes, didn't really make a dent in those numbers, and it might have made it worse. We'll dig a little more into the pandemic's effects shortly, but the point is, these rising numbers have led many health officials to raise an alarm and urge action. Many experts believing one of the causes behind this problem is the lack of knowledge about the basic principles of safe sex. You know, the stuff school sex ed is supposed to cover. In fact, a Centers for Disease Control survey from 2019 showed that nearly 46% of sexually active high school students did not use a condom the last time they had sex. That's a huge problem when you consider the fact that out of all new STDs reported to the CDC each year, half were among young people aged 15 to 24. So how large exactly is that figure? The numbers show there were 2.4 million cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis in 2020, the most recent year we have the complete data for. Chlamydia is currently the most common STD in the United States, with 1.6 million cases reported to the CDC that year. While its numbers saw a slight drop from 2016, the CDC notes that the drops are probably not really because of an actual drop in infections. Since chlamydia is usually asymptomatic, case rates are heavily influenced by screening coverage, which the pandemic worsened. Although overall cases of STDs and STIs fell in the pandemic's early months, the CDC acknowledges that's likely due to the reduced frequency of in-person healthcare services, resulting in fewer screenings. STD test and lab supply shortages, the diversion of health workers to pandemic response teams, and lapses in health insurance due to unemployment also contributed. The pandemic came after years of cuts to public health funding already. So as anticipated by many experts, numbers picked up again at the end of 2020, with other diseases like gonorrhea and syphilis surpassing 2019 levels, according to CDC data. And preliminary data from 2021 shows there were more than 2.5 million reported cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis in that year. So STDs and STIs continued to increase during the second year of the pandemic too, with no signs of slowing down. The CDC says it's likely we may never know the full impact of the pandemic on STDs. What is clear, however, is the state of STDs did not improve in the United States. Prevention and control efforts remain as important as ever. Our prevention and control methods need work. Comprehensive sex ed programs would be a start on prevention amongst the most commonly affected age group, but robust public testing and information campaigns could help all Americans. Public health funding, however, has faced slashes for years, taking a toll on STD screening and prevention efforts. Funding cuts will prevent the public health system, the safety net of being able to track down people's partners so that the you know your index patient doesn't get reinfected. Um, because their partner was also treated appropriately. So it's easy to say like people should take personal responsibility and come in for care, but I think the picture is a lot more complex than that. Only 2.5% of all health spending in the US, which is about $3.8 trillion by the way, is spent on public health and prevention programs. Last year, the Biden administration did announce a $1.13 billion investment to strengthen the disease intervention specialist workforce at the CDC, but much of that funding seems to be for the agency's pandemic response. Still, there's reason for some optimism. Let's take a moment to acknowledge our progress on STDs and STIs. We've come a long way since the HIV AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and 90s, when the STI spread rapidly in the country, especially among certain groups like men who have sex with other men. Years of public information campaigns and research into treatment brought numbers down through the early 2000s and to a stable level in 2013. More recent figures may seem to hint at further progress on the overall HIV cases during the early pandemic, but those figures are misleading too because of the sharp drop in testing. Plus, many experts have criticized the focus of historic HIV treatment and prevention efforts as largely being focused on treating rich, 
white, gay men, and transgender groups, leaving out many lower-income Americans, people of color, and women. Women, in general, face a greater burden when it comes to sexual health. Many studies have established that women have a higher biological risk for contracting many STIs and HIV than men, with a higher probability of transmission from men to women. Women tend to be more asymptomatic for a lot of, a lot of the conditions we're talking about. And um, so not having symptoms maybe gives people a false sense of security and then you know they don't come in to get the, the routine screening that they might have otherwise if things were open and accessible. Black women in particular suffer higher numbers of both HIV and other STDs like herpes, and many experts say public prevention efforts have failed to address these groups adequately. Overall inconsistencies in access to healthcare and prevention programs across different demographics throughout the country have affected our national battle against STDs and STIs. We need, we have had data that shows consistently what we need to be doing in the sexually transmitted infection state, uh, uh, cases in reproductive health, and we need to make sure that those policies are as standardized as possible so that they're easily implementable and therefore easy to track data, data that then feeds back into the funding pool, back into the policy pool. And now the situation has become more complicated after the latest Supreme Court verdict that revoked the constitutional right to an abortion. Many independent sexual health organizations and state departments included in the federal Title X family planning program, which offers birth control and other reproductive and sexual health care to low-income patients, were already receiving less funding than they had in previous years. Now, there's a new push for that program and similar health centers in general to get more funding after the reversal of Roe v. Wade, something that could affect the numbers of STDs and STIs among not only women, but also newborn children. Yeah, you heard that right. The prevalence of STD and STIs among women can also affect their fetuses and complicate their pregnancies. Newsy National correspondent Amber Strong explores this growing, and troubling trend. The pandemic has touched on just about every aspect of American life, exposing disparities and creating new challenges. For many healthcare workers, that means an uptick in things they thought the country had a grip on. So this is not just like an issue, it's a crisis. The U.S. had made strides against sexually transmitted infections like congenital syphilis in the early 2000s. Dr. Mati Haswalu Davis, director of health in St. Louis, says those gains have disappeared. We had a hyper focus on COVID that took away our ability and our, and, our, and our ability to really prioritize and understand that other aspects of health don't go away. According to the CDC, by the end of 2020, syphilis among newborns, which is generally passed during pregnancy, was up 15 percent from 2019 and 254 percent from 2016. Forty percent of babies born to women with untreated syphilis can be stillborn or die from the infection. Those that do survive face challenges. An untreated case of congenital syphilis can result in things like brain or bone malformations. Um, there can be uh, blindness over time or organ damage. Experts point to a myriad of reasons for the uptick. For one, people stopped getting checkups in 2020 or relied on telemed, which could miss a diagnosis. Another hurdle, public resources for combating STIs were often diverted to the COVID response. According to the director of Johns Hopkins HIV Women's Program, Dr. Anna Powell, the congruent opioid epidemic didn't help. Pregnant patients who are using substances during pregnancy, they're less likely to come in for prenatal care. There are also inconsistencies in healthcare requirements. According to the CDC, only 13 states and DC require all patients to undergo syphilis testing in both the first and third trimesters. Eight states don't require testing at all. Davis says none of that matters if a patient doesn't have access to care in the first place, an issue disproportionately facing ethnic minorities. We're seeing the same pattern, not just in STIs, but across all disease states. So that says it's not just about the genes, it's not about the specific disease, it's not about the specific issue, it's about those fundamental structural issues that need to be addressed. Doctors tell me one way to address the issue is to get rid of stigma. That means making the STI conversation routine in every doctor's appointment. Another way, making sure that partners are also treated for STIs. Things that sound simple, but take funding. Amber Strong, Newsy, Washington. All right, many thanks for covering that story, Amber. By the way, another group affected by the STD and STI rise is senior Americans with some infections reaching new record heights among those above the age of 55. To learn more about safe sex and how to practice it, you can log on to cdc.gov STD 
slash prevention. We'll be right back after this quick break with some of the other stories we've been keeping tabs on. 